Father, this morning we praise you because you are a God who is faithful. And when we call, you answer. Now, some of us are rejoicing today because we know that you have answered, you have rescued, you have pulled us up out of the depths of despair and darkness and failure. And you have set our feet on solid ground. And today we're here to praise you and celebrate the life that you've given us in Christ. But God, we're also here today because we need to be rescued. And we're calling upon you to, to heal us physically, spiritually, relationally. We're, we're asking that you would lift us up out of the depths that we have sunk to. Lord, some are here despairing of life even. And we pray that your spirit would move in this room. And whether we're here in desperation or in praise, that you would meet us in this place. And you would bring hope into our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Ezekiel. I know some of you didn't even know there was a book called Ezekiel in the Bible. That's okay. Uh, learn something new all the time. It's in the Old Testament. It's a little bit after Psalms. It's one of the prophets. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app uh, on your device, then grab one of the, the Bibles that are in the pews around you. Feel free to use one of those. Feel free to take one of those if you need it and you'll read it. So um, it, it's there for you. Hey, before we dive into the message, uh, let me just uh, uh, remind you that after Labor Day, so two weekends away, we're going back to five worship services on a weekend. We're going to have two on Saturday, one at 4.30, one at 6 again. And uh, guys, I want you to look around for a moment. It's August and we're full here at 9.30. And, and uh, yeah, isn't that cool? And, uh, and I'm rejoicing with that too, but I'm also looking at this going, uh, we don't have our, you know, people who ran away for the summer back yet. We don't have our snowbirds, uh, all that kind of stuff. And uh, so here's the request I'm going to make for you. I'm really going to uh, challenge some of you to seek God and ask if he would uh, have you come on Saturday nights. Uh, just as a way of opening up some space for people who need to know Christ, who, who want to come worship Him, uh, and, uh, and all of that. So, uh, you know, it's not like we're going to go down and number you off, you know, say one, two, three, and you've you know, you got to go. But, uh, but I know that there's some of you that uh, Saturday it would work, and, and we've got exactly the same service. Exact, Miss Julie's here. Your kids might get a little more personal attention because there won't be quite as many of them. Uh, but uh, it's just something for you to consider. So uh, we need, you know, 40, 50 people to pick one of the services. It doesn't matter which one. They're about evenly divided on Saturday. And, and move to that service as your uh, part of your service to God is uh, just moving your time. So if you're up to that, uh, I'm just throwing it out there. Again, that starts after Labor Day weekend, two weekends away. And because uh, uh, otherwise we're going to uh, we'll, we'll just be overflowing. And, uh, uh, and that's a great problem to have because we're getting ready to build a building. So that said, Ezekiel 37 is where we're going to be. We're starting a series called Words of the Wise. And we're looking at messages of three prophets over the next three weeks. And we're, uh, we're starting with Ezekiel. But uh, we've got three of these guys that we're going to be taking a look at uh, and find out more what they say uh, to us out of their wisdom. Now, a lot of people think of prophets kind of like one big lump of like, oh, these guys were prophets and so they were all just the same. They're just the same like, you know, preachers are all just the same or that, you know, Christians are all just the same. In other words, they weren't just the same. And, and just as God doesn't really want us to produce cookie-cutter Christians, uh, he didn't produce cookie-cutter prophets. There were all different kinds of prophets. You had Samuel, who was like the prophet and judge. And, and he kind of ruled the, the land and anointed the kings and, and started off uh, that, whole, that whole era of Israel. You had Elijah who a lot of consider the greatest prophet. You know, he's a guy who called down fire from heaven and, and uh, declared a drought on Israel for like three years and, and just did all these amazing things. Uh, you had Isaiah, who was considered the prince of the prophets because he hung out with the kings, and he was there for like three kings' uh, uh, time. You had Jeremiah, who was kind of the prophet of doom because he kept telling him, Jerusalem's going to fall, Jerusalem's going to fall. You guys got to repent or Jerusalem's going to fall. And they tortured this guy. I mean, they threw him in jail, and they, they, they tried to punish him. They tried to do all kinds of stuff, and he still just kept coming back and saying, guys, you got to repent or it's going to get bad. And of course it got bad. And then there's Ezekiel. And, and if you don't know anything about Ezekiel, let me just tell you this way. Uh, Ezekiel is like the freak of the prophets. I mean, no prophets were really normal because they were like the spokesman for God. But Ezekiel was like the freak. I mean, if it was a Seinfeld episode, he's Kramer. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I mean, God had this guy, I mean, he had visions, like crazy visions that no one else had ever imagined. And, and he, uh, God asked him to do like physical prophecy. And, and you really don't want to go there. But physical prophecy, he had him actually kind of like lay on a, in a catatonic state for over a year on one side. Didn't move. Didn't leave his house. And, and then you know, that was to pronounce judgment on Israel. And then he like turned over and laid there for like another month and a half on his, on his right side. Just crazy things. He, God told him to eat food that had been cooked over dung as a prophecy. Yeah, not, not cool, huh? Some of you are going, gross. In fact, Ezekiel was so uh, wild, so strange, so out there that it was kind of R-rated. They didn't let children and women read Ezekiel. Yeah, some of you are like, that's in the Bible? i got to read this stuff. Yeah, it, they wouldn't let women and children read it because it was so graphic in its language and disturbing in its themes. <laughs> Some of you are going like, I'm going to read it right now. Just <laughs> wait till tonight, read it. And if you really want to plumb the depths, uh, chapter 23 is where it's really disgusting. So, uh, <laughs> hey, I want you to read the Bible. And there's a lot of people who think the Bible's boring, but it is not boring. Yeah, there's some of those chapters that are, you know, serve as like, you know, uh, sleep aids, but uh, Ezekiel is not one of them. So uh, we're going to look at Ezekiel 37 today, and it's a very familiar passage if you've grown up in church or you've heard some of this imagery before. It's one of his wild visions. Chapter 37, beginning in verse 1, says, The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. I want you to think about this right away. He's already describing sort of a nightmare. Right? He is landing in a place that is filled with bones. Just dead people's bones all around him. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very, very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Pause right there. That's a nightmare for a lot of you have had, right? Standing in a valley filled with zombies, and you're the only one who's alive in the midst of them? See, and you thought Hollywood had original ideas. Verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know what I, that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. So what is the, val the vision of the dry bones in context? You just read a really wild vision that Ezekiel had, and, and, uh, and what was the purpose of that vision? Well, let me just put it in context for you. The nation of, of Judah, the southern kingdom out of the two kingdoms, the, whose capital was Jerusalem, the very heart of the Israelite nation, uh, had been destroyed. Uh, the Babylonian Empire had come, and in 587 B.C., they uh, besieged Jerusalem. They conquered it. They tore down the temple, which was the holy place. They, they shattered the walls, so they were defenseless. And they took all of the leaders, the royalty, the priests, the educated people, the people who were wealthy. They carried them all into exile, all the way to Babylon, hundreds upon hundreds of miles away. 
And there they were hopeless. They were despondent. They were defeated. They, they were despairing because they had no hope of going home. They had no chance. They, they saw no possibility of life as a nation, as a people again. They thought they were done in. And so they were the dry bones. And God, through Ezekiel, is promising new life. He's offering them hope. And God, that God will restore the nation. That God can do anything, even make dead bones live. And so God is saying through Ezekiel, they'll be restored, repaired, and rebirthed as a people. And, and by the way, it happens, just as Ezekiel pro- prophesied. About 70 years later, the Babylonian Empire is conquered by the Persian Empire. And the Persian king, King Artaxerxes, says, hey, you, you Jews, you can go home. You can go back to Jerusalem. You can have your city again. And so they go back to Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple. And and then they rebuild the walls and they function again as a city, as a nation. Now most of that time, they were under somebody else's rule. The Persians and then the Greeks and then the Romans through the time of Messiah ruled Israel. But they had their temple. They had their city. They had their identity as a nation. So this was a tremendous message of hope to people who were broken and despairing. That's the context. So what is about the Valley of Dry Bones today? What do we need to know? What do we need to understand? Because this was written directly to a group of exiles 2,600 years ago about their situation and their condition. So what does it mean to us when we read this? You know, besides the fact that Ezekiel was a freak and had really cool visions, what what do we need to learn? Well, here's some things I see in this that I think apply to us. Uh, First of all, we kind of live... In a valley of dry bones, don't we? And I'm not talking about the t-shirts that say, it's a dry heat, you know. (laughs) Although, those would be kind of appropriate for this message, wouldn't they? Um, But literally, here in Lake Havasu, we are surrounded by people with flesh and sinews and blood, but no breath. No real life is in them. And many of them are hopeless, they're despairing, they're broken, they're captives to their desires and addictions, they're exiles who are far from God. And our friends, our family, our neighbors have all the trappings of life, but something is missing. Something is missing. And, and, and this is what caught my eye in verse 8. As, and I looked, and behold, there were sinews upon them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them no breath means you're not alive not really alive and we know that there's no breath apart from Jesus there's no breath apart from Jesus Um, let me teach you a little bit of Hebrew today I don't usually do this but this is so cool this is something I want to for you to just stick in your mind and comfort your soul in the Hebrew the word for breath is the word ruach You have to spit a little when you say it to get it right. So it's ruach. And ruach is a word that's for breath. But it's also the word that is used for wind. And it's also the word that is used for spirit. They they use the same word. So whenever you read the Old Testament, you read wind, breath, or spirit. It's the same word and they're interpreting it based on the context. And and so when the spirit of God moved over the waters at creation, it, it could have been the breath of God. Or God caused this wind to blow. Uh, And then God put his spirit, breathed the spirit into Adam in creation. And and, and so when you start thinking about this, you you see how many times wind and breath and spirit are are used in this passage. And you go, wow, this is important. Because Jesus breathed on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The only way to real life, to full life, is to embrace Jesus and receive the life-changing Holy Spirit. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ today, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, then please understand what happened the moment you confessed Jesus as Lord. God put his Holy Spirit in you. And the Holy Spirit is who transformed you from being dead spiritually to having eternal life. He is the one who brought that forgiveness of sins to bear on your life. And he is the one who marked you for Christ and guarantees your salvation. The Holy Spirit is in you and he's the voice of conviction of God in your life. And he is the one who is working to change you and grow you and teach you the things of God. 
And so the Holy Spirit is in you. And he is the one who has brought real life to you. And this is echoed by, by scripture. Ezekiel, a chapter earlier in verse 26 says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's a new life. In Acts chapter 2, Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8 says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So Jesus transforms us from dry, empty shells to people with a life of purpose and love and significance. That's what He does. That's His ministry in our lives. He raises us from death and gives us eternal life. God wants to give you a new life today. Have you received the breath of God? Have you come to that place in your life where you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ and you know that the Holy Spirit of God is in you and he has changed your life? Understand, I'm not talking about you deciding to turn over a new leaf. I'm not talking about you being religious or attending church. I'm not talking about you being a good person or having been baptized or anything like that. I'm not even talking about being a church member. What I'm talking about is do you know that you have had a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ and that the Holy Spirit of God is in you as the breath that gives life? Because I don't want you to be you know, somebody who calls yourself a Christian but really is living a zombie life because you're flesh and blood and all that kind of stuff, but you don't have the breath. And I can't tell from the outside, only you know it. You and God know this. And if you have any doubt about your relationship with Jesus Christ and whether or not the Spirit of God has transformed you from death to life, then the, the conversation you need to have needs to stop listening to me and start talking to God and just say, God, I want you to change my life. I, I, I embrace Jesus as my Savior. Forgive me and change me. And he will do that because, well, that's what he came to do. And that's what he's called us to do. And he wants us to receive Christ, the life, it is wrapped up in the breath. So I want you to see there's no breath apart from Jesus. And I want you to respond to him. Now, if you know that you have that breath, you know that Jesus is your Savior, you know you're a follower, then I want you to see that God invites us to participate. God invites you and I to participate with him in this life-changing mission. Look at the conversation again that happens in verses 3 through 6. This is so cool. By the way, I've never had a conversation with God like this. I would love to have one. It might freak me out, but I would love to have one. If you've had a conversation with God like this, I'd love to hear about it sometime. God says, son of man, that's Ezekiel. He says, can these bones live? All these dead bones around you, can these come to life? And Ezekiel says, oh Lord God, you know. God, you know they can. God, you're the creator. God, you're the one who has delivered your people out of slavery and given us a nation. You're the one who can do anything. God, yes, you know that you can. Ezekiel believes that God can do anything. And because he believes, God invites him to participate. Son of man, prophesy over these bones. And say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. He gives him a task. He says, I want you to help me. I want you to be part of this. I want you to do this. Now, there's two things in this that I, I want you to see. First of all, that question, can these bones live? That's a huge question because he's really asking Ezekiel, Ezekiel, do you believe that I have the power to restore life to these dead bones? Ezekiel, do you believe that I have the power to bring Israel as a nation back from captivity again and back to, to uh, Jerusalem? Do you believe this, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel says yes, and, and I'm going to ask you this. If you're a follower of Christ today, do you believe that God has the power to change lives? Do you believe that God can restore families, that God can, can, can deliver people from their addictions? Do you believe that God has the power to do anything? You see, that's a question that you got to struggle with. Because here's what happens. If we don't believe, then we don't participate. If we don't believe, then we don't uh, invite our friends to church. 
If we don't believe, then we don't offer people hope when they are despairing. If we don't really believe that God has the power to change lives, then we don't tell anybody how he's changed our life. And we become kind of zombie Christians. Oh, we've got the breath in us, but we just don't believe enough to share it with anyone else. And, and, and that's a tragic place to be. I've, I've sat and talked with pastors and seen church members in, in places all across this nation where, where you can just see it in their eyes that they've given up hope that God really has the power to change anyone. And, and, and you see churches where people gather week after week and they go through the motions, but there's no life in them because they don't ever bring anyone and they don't ever expect a miracle and they don't ever celebrate life change. You know, one of the things I'm really excited about leading here at Calvary is the fact that you guys believe. You guys believe that God can change lives. And how do I know that? Because you bring your friends. You bring your neighbors. You bring your family. You get excited about what God is doing. You celebrate life change, just like we saw this morning. And, and you start expecting the miracles to happen. And, and so you get even more excited to tell people what God has done in your life. And you're not ashamed of the mistakes you made because God has redeemed you from those mistakes. You see, that's what it means to believe. And then when we believe that God can make these bones live, God invites us to participate. He invites us to participate. Son of man, prophesy over these bones. Do something. And, and God invites Ezekiel to be part of this miracle. Now, here's the really cool thing. God doesn't need Ezekiel to make those bones live, does he? He's God. He can just make those bones live. He spoke Everything into being that is. He, he, you know, he, he's, he can do whatever he wants to. He doesn't need Ezekiel, but he invites Ezekiel. Hey, come apart. And you prophesy to the bones. And then you prophesy to the breath. And you be part of this. Friends, God invites us as followers of Jesus Christ to be a part of his life-changing miracle called salvation. Not just to receive it, but to be part of his army that's out there prophesying to people who are hopeless and despairing and sharing with them and encouraging them and inviting them and loving them and showing them that God really has a plan and a purpose for their life. We get to do this. And I hope that you can see in the story that if we're going to see life change happen on a ridiculous level, that God doesn't need us. He doesn't need Chad Garrison to preach. He doesn't need any of us to carry out his will, but he wants us to. He's literally saying, hey, I'm going to go change the world. You guys want to come along for the ride? You want to be a part of this? You want to celebrate life change with me? Then come on, let's go. We get to do this. That's why it's our mission here at Calvary, to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So will you join Jesus in the mission of life change? Do you believe that he can make these bones live again. Finally, I want you to see in this story that the breath is life. The breath is life. Uh, you know, even as followers of Jesus Christ, we can get dry. Can't we? I mean, we're, we can get to those places of brokenness and despair ourselves, even though we know that salvation is promised to us, even though we know the Spirit of God is in us. Sometimes we can get dry, and, and we're kind of desperate for life again as well. And, and I know it's much easier in church just to go ahead and pretend that once we accept Christ, we got our acts together, but that's such a lie. I, I mean, isn't it? I, I mean, am I the only one who ever kind of gets to that place where you go, God, I really, really, really need you, and I need you again and again and again to fill me? And so we're in that place, and, and we get dry, and, and sometimes we wonder, God, can these bones live again? And we get, just like the Israelites who are in exile, we get far from God, and we get despairing, and we get in a dark place. And I want you to know that the breath is life. The Spirit of God is life. And, and, and you know, the Word of God encourages us to live by the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to pray in the Spirit, not to quench the Spirit, to let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, and to be filled with the Spirit. And we read those, and, and we need to believe that God can breathe life into our souls again. That wherever you are, whatever your brokenness, whatever your source of dryness, that, that God really can heal you and restore you and offer you hope again. Because he's the one who can heal and empower and convict and restore your life. Now, if you're a follower today who's, who's dry and you're desperate for that breath of life again, or 
if you're just a follower of Jesus Christ who wants more life, you're like, this is good stuff, but I, I don't want to stop. I want more. Let me just share with you three actions to take to invite the Spirit into your life on a deeper level. First one is inhale deeply. Inhale deeply. Why do I say that? Because the Spirit and the breath is the same. The Holy Spirit and the breath is the same. And, and, and I want you to inhale deeply because if you need air to live, you need the Spirit to really live. And, and, and I know some of you are kind of going, where are you going with this? Let me just put it this way. Um, our relationship with God is not just spiritual, it's physical. Because there's all kinds of statements throughout Scripture that connect the, the body. After all, you know, when we, when we die and we go to heaven, we get new bodies. Yeah, if the body wasn't important, then you think God would give us new bodies? He'd go, ah, I can trash that thing now. Get rid of it. You don't ever need it again. You just float around. No, we get new bodies, perfect bodies, bodies that don't get sick or aged or, or, or hurt. And, and, and the Apostle Paul said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That, that God actually indwells us through the Holy Spirit. We talked about this earlier, how when you confess Christ, the Holy Spirit came and he lives in you. Not just around you or near you or like calls in from someplace else. He lives in you. And, and so he's in you and therefore glorify God with your body. And, and scripture tells us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. Which is why we're, we're encouraged to, to bow down before God as an act of worship. To lift up holy hands to God as an act of worship. And I'm encouraging you to breathe as an act of worship. Inhale deeply. Don't just, you know, breathe. By the way, you know, if you've ever been anxious and you've ever talked to someone, they teach you breathing techniques to try to calm down, right? You ever, you're aware of this or to relax, you know, relaxation techniques. Inhale deeply, count, you know, and then exhale slowly, all that kind of stuff. Anybody with me there? Or am I just like nuts? Okay. Um, here's the thing. That's this basis in Scripture. If the breath is the spirit, which is life, and you inhale deeply to calm down, why don't you voice a prayer with that? God, I need you, and I want you to fill me. How cool would that be? And whenever you're anxious and you say, okay, I'm supposed to breathe, and i got to breathe in the spirit, not just air. God, I want you to fill me, and I need you. It's kind of like when you're getting ready to swim. All right, you guys ever been in a pool? Okay. Yeah, you guys even raise your hands like, oh, that's a dumb question. Sorry, kind of in a dumb mood. And, and uh, you ever been in a pool and you're getting ready, and, and I know maybe some of you ladies, but you ever swim underwater, right? You have to hold your breath, breath right. And, and if you're, and you're like me, you're like, I can I make it all the way down underwater or then down and back underwater, or down and back, down, you know, kind of the thing, how many times can I do this? And what do you do when you're getting ready to do that? You don't just kind of go, okay, I'm going to do this. No, you start breathing, right? And you want to get that oxygenation in your body so you can hold your breath longer and you take that big breath because you're getting ready to go deeper. Would you inhale deeply if you really want Christ in your life? I know it sounds weird, but connect it with prayer and, and let the Spirit fill you physically and spiritually. So inhale deeply and develop your lung capacity. Uh, like runners and athletes work out to expand their lung capacity, you need to expand your spiritual lung capacity. Any, any runners in the room? <laughs> really? Let's try this again. Any runners in the room? Yeah, there's like three or four people that raise their hand. Okay. Anybody ever say, hey, I'm going to run and try it once? Okay, a lot more hands go up there. Thank you. Because that was me. I thought, you know, I'm going to run. And so you get up and you're like, okay, I'm going to stretch a little bit. Okay, I'm done with that. And you head out the door. And by the end of the driveway, you're like, <sighs> can't breathe. My lungs are burning. And then you have your friends that you go run with, right? And they're all just chipper and they're jogging along, talking to each other. And they ask you a question. And you're like, shut up. I can't breathe. <laughs> I'm trying to stay alive here. But you get up the next day and you go with them and the next day and you go with them and the day after that and one day you're jogging along and you're having that conversation and the newbie behind you is the one sucking wind. <laughs> Why? Because you developed your lung capacity. We need to do the same thing spiritually. 
Now, you might have a low lung capacity physically because you're sick. You know, maybe you got COPD or emphysema or some other kind of, uh, uh, you know, breathing disorder and, and you need oxygen and, you, and you're struggling for breath. It, there's nothing you can really do about that. But maybe you just don't have a very good lung capacity because, let's face it, you're lazy. Right? Because you're not going to develop a lung capacity like this. Kick back with the remote control, flipping channels. That does not develop lung capacity. Right here? This is not exercise. And some of us have low capacity spiritually because we're sick. We're holding on to sin in our life that is killing us, that is destroying us, and we know it, but we don't want to let go of it, and we can do something about it if we'll repent and we'll ask God to free us from that. And some of us just don't have a very big spiritual lung capacity because we're lazy. And we've never stepped into the discipline of trying to grow deeper with Christ. And by the way, those disciplines are things like prayer, where you breathe in the Holy Spirit. And you have that conversation with him. Or reading the Bible. Why do we want you to read the Bible? Because it's the word of God. And if you want to hear God's voice, he will speak to you from this book. In fact, I told you, I've never had a conversation with God like Ezekiel. But I've had conversations with God that center around this word. Because God speaks to me out of his word. And because I memorize it, he speaks to me from his word into my life. So prayer, Bible reading, participating in worship. Not just enjoying the music, but participating in worship. Being in a life group, serving, giving. These are all disciplines that if you will embrace upon them, it's a long-term commitment to change. And at first it will be hard and it will be awkward and you'll be like, I don't know if I'm going to do this tomorrow. But if you'll keep doing it, you'll develop a spiritual lung capacity that will enable you to breathe in more deeply of the Spirit. And then finally, if you want to get closer, if you want to get refreshed, then you've got to breathe daily. Now, physically, you never think about breathing unless you can't, right? You ever notice that? You know, if you're sick and you're struggling to breathe, then you think about it all the time because you can't get your breath. Or if uh, you've ever had an asthma attack and you can't get your breath, that's a, that freaks you out, doesn't it? Or if you've ever been swimming, you know, and you have older brothers and you're a kid and they hold you under to the point of drowning and you start freaking out and panicking and flailing and, and swinging, you know, fists and things because you're desperate, suddenly... Breathing becomes very important to you. But here's the thing. Spiritually, you have to intentionally breathe. You have to mean to do it. You have to think about it and say, hey, I'm going to breathe in spiritually. So will you breathe daily? Here, here's my challenge to you. Will you start each day with the breath of God? Will you wake up and will you breathe God in and say, hey, God, I, I want you to be part of your life, my, my life today. I want you to fill me and control me today. God, I, I want to honor you with my words and my deeds today. God, I want you to correct me when I'm wrong and use me to build lives. See, here's the thing. If you start each morning breathing that prayer, God, I want you to fill me and control me today. God, I want to honor you with my words and deeds. God, uh, I want you to correct me and use me. You start with that each morning, and what will happen is eventually you'll start morning and night, and then eventually you start morning, noon, and night, and then eventually throughout your day you'll be consciously inviting God to control your life, and you'll be more aware of him than you ever have, and his life will flow into you. But you got to breathe daily because the breath is life, and there is no breath apart from Jesus. So do you believe, can these bones live? Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that you love us and that you're patient with us and that you're the God who restores us when we ask. Lord, today we're calling upon you and we're asking that you would answer and that you would restore life where it is broken and, and desolate that you would fill us with your spirit and you would teach us how to physically invite you into our lives on a daily basis. Lord, we need you. We're desperate for you. And so we ask that you would meet us in this place and you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.